uh, on the social ontology as theoretical modeling. Oh, well, thank you, Rafael, for the invitation. I've been looking forward to this talk. In his uh, 1969 book, Convention, David Lewis presented one of the first exemplars of what I would now like to think of as a model based approach to social ontology, a research field at the intersection of philosophy and social science that is concerned with the nature and basic constituents of the social world. Now, the full title of Lewis's book was Convention, a Philosophical Study, but his approach was quite unusual for the philosophy of his time in the sense that he borrowed methods and tools from decision theory and game theory to study questions that he considered to be of philosophical as well as, of course, empirical significance. Lewis proposed identifying paradigmatic social conventions, a central category of social facts if there was one, with the equilibria of pure coordination games, where the interests of the agent are perfectly aligned but they have to choose between several alternative equilibria that they are in principle indifferent between. Lewis used his analysis of convention not only for analyzing social practices, such as dressing in a certain manner for formal occasions or dining with a knife and fork, but also for understanding how meaning may arise from seemingly arbitrary symbols, giving rise to an increasingly prominent approach to studying language as a coordination game. One example of a Lewisian convention that can be modeled as a pure coordination game is the convention of driving on the right or left hand side of the road. We are indifferent about which side of the road we drive on as long as others follow the same traffic rules. And it would be worst of all if we all fail to coordinate. Equilibrium selection in such games can be driven by the history of play, by official decree, or simply by salience, as in the case where several individuals are asked to coordinate a number between 0 and 10. In this case, then it will choose 0 because it is the salient alternative. As opposed to social norms, conventions are not necessarily backed by sanction, nor need they be Pareto optimal in the sense that there's no way to make at least one player off better off without making at least one player worse off. For example, shaking hands is an effective way to pass on germs, and hence it might be all things considered best for people to greet each other by nodding politely upon encountering one another instead of by shaking hands. However, it is difficult for one individual to deviate from the convention of shaking hands for fear of sanctions or rebuke, and it would be worse if there were no conventional way of greeting at all. Now, my concern in this presentation is not with the details of Lewis's analysis of social convention, but with the general strategy of investigation that his approach exemplified. That of studying questions of social ontological significance through a method of indirect investigation of the world by the mediation of a model. Lewis's approach can be contrasted with studying empirically how people in fact solve these types of coordination problems. For example, in Sweden, people used to drive on the left-hand side of the world until, by decree, they changed to a convention of right-sided traffic in 1967. Hence, one might study empirically what arrangements were put in place so as to ensure that the transition went as smoothly as possible, how many collisions there were, and how many people absent-mindedly took off on the wrong side of the road the following morning. Social scientists have also studied how people in different countries and environments have solved more complex coordination and collective action problems, including prisoner's dilemma and tragedy of the commons type, types of cases where there can be millions rather than a few participants and where the cases may range from seemingly harmless littering to severe environmental damage. Although these studies are important and interesting, they exhibit, in my view, a different strategy of investigation from the model-based strategy that Lewis made use of, a difference that does not come down merely to the use of formal game theoretic 
or mathematical tools. The contrast that I have in mind is the contrast between a strategy of indirect investigation of the world by the mediation of a model as contrasted with directly intervening in the world and studying it through experiment and observation. As many philosophers of science have argued, theoretical models abound in disciplines where direct empirical study of the world is inconvenient or impossible because of causal complexity or rarity of manifestation. For example, one might consider climate models in environmental science, consumer choice theory in economics, and ecological models of population of predator prey interaction. As these examples indicate, the distinction between direct and indirect investigation of the world is not peculiar to social ontology, nor to the social sciences more generally. Consider one famous episode in the history of science that does not rely on a methodology of model construction. Charles Darwin's work on the evolution of species by natural selection grew on a variety of empirical evidence regarding certain aspects of the fossil record and the geological distribution of species. Darwin was not a model, although he was a scientist, and his work involved little mathematical sophistication, although his theory has later been accommodated by mathematical models of evolution under the modern evolutionary synthesis. Instead, Darwin seems to have used something like inference to the best explanation, where we infer from the truth of a set of empirical observations, the truth of a theory that would best explain those observations. For another example of a type of scientific investigation that does exemplify a strategy of model construction, one might consider what else of preferences in utility theory in economics. Preferences in standard textbook economics are assumed to satisfy a number of axioms such as completeness, with reflexivity and transitivity. We know from experiments that people do not always satisfy the axiom of transitivity. However, these assumptions are typically not justified by their psychological plausibility, but by their mathematical tractability and their capacity to approximate human behavior when applied over a suitably long period of time, thus allowing for learning or to a suitably large population, thus allowing for some individual deviation from rationality. As this example indicates, theoretical models can accommodate, accommodate many abstractions, idealizations, and even outright falsehoods if they do not interfere with the theoretical goals that the model is supposed to serve. In the case of utility theory, increased realism comes at the expense of lesser mathematical tractability when scaling up from one individual utility function to the market as a whole. While in the case of mathematical models of evolution, tractability can be increased by assuming that population sizes are infinite and unstructured in space, as well as the assumption that they differ on with respect to simple and individual genetic features. To analyze the structure of theoretical modeling, we can use a formula that Ronald Gear has proposed. S uses X to represent W for purposes P. Here S is the scientist or user of the model. X is the model system, which may be concrete, as in the case of model organisms, 
and scale models or abstract a system specified linguistically by mathematical formulae or by some other means. W is the presumptive target of the model and P is the theoretical goal of modeling which may have to do with control, explanation, prediction or some other set of theoretical goals. To get back to social ontology, I would like to consider an account that does not explicitly rely on the type of game theoretic apparatus that my first example regarding Lewis's analysis of social conventions relied on. This is why I want to analyze I mode V mode approach to social reality. Tuomo has presented a highly idealized approach to social cognition according to which people can function in two categorically distinct modes, the I mode and the V mode. In his account, individuals functioning in the V mode are assumed to completely set aside their private attitudes and motives in the group context and to take their reasons for action from what the group believes, desires, and intends. Tuomala also endorses the collective acceptance view of social institutions according to which central categories of social institutions, such as money, as a medium of exchange and store of value, are dependent upon the performative and reflexive collective acceptance of the members of a group. In my paper, A Model Based Approach to Social Ontology, I provide a model based reconstruction of Tuomas I mode V mode framework, where I compare the status of Tuomas account to the theoretical status of decision theoretic, theoretic models of choice in economics, among other things. In my view, Tuomas account involves numerous unrealistic assumptions. For example, he assumes that there is a categorical switch between the two modes, that individuals act in one mode at most relative to a particular activity at a time, and that I mode and V mode reasons cannot be weighed against each other. However, to point out that this model is unrealistic does not yet suffice to invalidate the model because it may still be useful for some theoretical purposes on a higher level of abstraction, perhaps for prediction, for explaining our normative intuition, or for some other set of purposes. Generalize, I would like to draw attention to the two straight structure of theoretical modeling. In general, in ideal circumstances, theoretical modeling proceeds as follows. First, one constructs an abstract model to serve as a surrogate of some real system in the world and studies the properties of the model either in the laboratory of the mind or through some other medium, for example, to a computer simulation or system of equations. Then in the second stage of model based science, one formulates hypotheses about in what respect and to what ex extent the model may be similar to the world. Although in practice, of course, there may be back and forth motion between the two stages. Theoretical models can also be studied in their own way, independently of the formulation of specific hypotheses about how the model fits the world. This is arguably the case for some models at the more theoretical end of economics and evolutionary science such as in the case of models of critics mating in evolutionary biology. My view is that this is the case for many philosophical models of social ontology as well. Whether these models turn out to be true or useful is a matter that can be investigated separately from the elaboration, articulation, and development of these models, a task that philosophers specialize in 
that is the first dot, not the second one. I think that adopting a model-based perspective on theoretical practice can help in identifying certain types of standards of success that apply and do not apply to social ontology and other fields of philosophical investigation. Our first merit of this view is that this can be used to establish a rather robust type of continuity between social ontology and social scientific practice in accordance with methodological naturalism without presupposing that all serious scientific investigation is empirical investigation. And in this sense, a model-based perspective differs quite significantly from the perspective of experimental philosophy. Furthermore, a model-based perspective can help us to push back on over-reliance on intuition and success criterion philosophical theorizing, even if intuitions can sometimes serve a useful heuristic, a useful heuristic guide to model construction. Moreover, focusing on model construction as a specific method of philosophical practice can help to direct our attention at specific continuities as well as possible differences between theosophical models of the social world and the types of abstract theoretical models that are used by social scientists, such as agent-based game theoretic and network models. However, there is no reason to assume that all of social ontology is theoretical modeling, just as theoretical modeling is not all of science. The fruitfulness of this methodological perspective can be seen from its application. Apart from my own work, ideas related to theoretical modeling have, in fact, years been applied to the domain of theoretical epistemology, ethics, philosophy of language, as well as the philosophy of mind. It is possible that much traditional philosophical investigation that does not self-consciously rely on a methodology of moral construction can be reconstrued or reframed in this spirit. But it is also possible that some of it may not. And whether we choose to adopt this particular perspective depends on its payoff, because different standards of success are appropriate to the practice of theoretical modeling than to other forms of scientific practice. That is where I will end. Oh, thank you uh, very much, Mati, for, for your interesting talk. Um, I don't know if there are questions. So, okay, Thomas, you have a question? Uh, yeah, uh, can you hear me? Is this, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, I was just wondering about um, this uh, this final claim that, I mean, it seems plausible that, that not everything fits this sort of modeling picture of, uh, not everything that goes on in social ontology fits this modeling picture, but I wonder if you could tell me a bit more about what the sort of features of a research uh, program or approach would be that would defeat us understanding it in this modeling fashion because there are of course features that pretty much any uh theory in social ontology has in common such as just being fairly abstract in general and so forth um that one could latch onto and 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 think oh well that that makes it a bit like a model but obviously that would be I mean, that would be too weak a basis, I guess, to base that sort of uh, sort of claim on. So, I mean, maybe you could give me an example of something that, by your standards, definitely would not be uh, uh, an approach in social ontology that 
could be understood as modeling just so i can get a bit of a grip on on what you think is are uh, the the crucial features here are yeah i think uh the one of based approaches really at odds with uh certain type of over reliance on conceptual intuitions and here i think it's uh instructive to look at precisely the types of criticism that uh margaret gilbert has presented at at uh, lucy's theory of conventions and uh one of her main arguments seems to be that uh, Lewis's account doesn't fit with our sort of common sense conception of what a convention is. And uh, and if uh, Lewis's work is, uh, is uh, constituted in this uh, model based theory, I think that type of objection would be inappropriate. Right. So would you think then that, say, Gilbert's own approach is the kind of thing that uh, we would be hard pressed to understand as a as a, a modeling kind of type of yeah. theory? Right. Yeah, I would. Right. Precisely because it, it aims to sort of accord with intuition at all points and that sort of thing. Right. Uh, okay. Right. Okay, thank you. That that helps me get a grip on on how this uh, how this is meant to work. Thanks. Um, Dan, you have a question. Thank you, <clears throat> Matty. I uh, really enjoyed your paper. One kind of modeling which has been very um, prominent in the past ten years or so in the social world, as you know, is agent based modeling. And one concern I've had, you made a central point that. The realism of the assumptions of a model should not be the primary way of evaluating the model. Uh, but the claims which are made by people like the other Epstein, Joshua Epstein, are very, very strong claims about uh, social explanation. I'm thinking of his model, for example, of um, uprisings and revolution, where he basically goes from a model of agents where the agents have grievances and the agents have a view of the police officers in the region, and then conflict or subordination results as a result of basically the geographical uh, distribution of uh, people with uh, grievances and people with truncheons. Um, this to me seems like such a simplistic view of uh, contention, especially when you compare it to people like Chuck Tilley, who have much more um, many leveled view of the origins of contention. So I guess I, the question I'd like to ask you is, is there a level at which a, a model, a computational model may have such simplistic assumptions that it's really not very valuable in terms of uh, providing a basis for explanation of important social phenomena? Yeah, that's uh, which we just heard in the field of science, of course, about when um, minimal models um, explain and minimal models here refer to models with just uh, extremely simple assumptions where many agent-based models would be sort of uh, a good example of, of this type of modeling and uh, I think one of course needs to look at it on a case by case basis so, basis, so I can carefully comment on that specific case because I haven't, haven't looked at it but something I would like to emphasize uh, is that and something that I did not not mentioned the talk is that uh, while I regard theoretical modeling as a distinctive strategy of, of uh, investigation which contrasts with the uh, direct empirical study of the world, within theoretical modeling there are also different strategies of modeling and agent-based modeling is one distinctive way bottom-up approach to model construction which may have some quite distinctive uh, epistemic sort of benefits and maybe also some distinctive challenges that it faces. If I could quote the Epstein slogan in generative science, if you haven't grown it, you haven't explained it, which makes the assumption that the only legitimate social explanation is a generative one based on relatively simple assumptions about agent behavior. To me, that seems overly simple. Yeah, that also does seem to me like an overly ambitious claim. I would not agree with that. 
Um, Asa had a question. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Matti, for your interesting talk. Uh, I was interested in, you said that we shouldn't rely too much on uh, intuitions or not overly relying on uh, intuitions. And then you also mentioned that the theoretical models, sometimes we don't um, test them by specific empirical hypothesis or try to come up with that. So I was uh, interested in what kind of criteria if you have two different abstract theoretical models, what kind of criteria would you use to uh, evaluate them against each other with? Yeah, it of course depends on, on, the, uh, on the goals of modeling. And I guess uh, your also comparison with uh, economics can be useful because a lot of people who use, uh, for example, uh, uh, with their preference, theory in economics, they, you know, they don't even themselves think that those models are particularly realistic. They just use them for the sake of tractability. And uh, then they often hold the belief that uh, they will be approximately uh, true when applied to some population or over a period of time, because uh, people basically learn from their mistakes. And this can also be shown in certain types of, types of economic experiments that people sort of uh, when they practice a certain type of bargaining problem, they over time start to uh, behave more rationally in the economic sense because they basically learn the rules of the game. So uh, I, I, I think one really needs to, needs to sort of uh, be more explicit about what uh, theoretical models in social ontology they are construed as such, what are the goals that they purport uh, to serve and uh, a lot of philosophers uh, these days, they, uh, uh, they use this uh, type of language that sounds pretty naturalistic. Um, they speak of uh, their you know, conceptual accounts explaining the social world and so forth. But uh, if uh, <laughs> it's the extent that, that uh, philosophical work proceeds a lot by conceptual analysis and elaboration of models, that doesn't yet explain much. There's an additional step that one needs to take, and that's the second stage of modeling. And sort of uh, the perspective I have is that uh, uh, that to take that step, one may need to appeal to some further resources than what further investigation can deliver. And that is one of the reasons why sort of being very explicit about what what modeling is, what it entails, and what different stages it involves can be very useful because otherwise it's very easy to sort of overstate one's case. Thank you. Brian, you have a question? Yes, hi, Matthew, very nice, nice talk. <clears throat> so um, my, my question is sort of along the same lines as Thomas's question. Um, I'm kind of um, curious how broadly applicable this is, um, and um, you know, I, I wonder. I guess I, I sort of have two ways of asking this. One is to sort of um, wonder how you, how and whether you would distinguish models from a kind of analysis. And I'm thinking of Tuomo's uh, analyses, or maybe say Bratman on shared intention, um, where you might understand those as giving um, maybe not a full analysis of shared intention, but maybe. Um, you know, kind of minimal sufficient grounding conditions um, for, uh, for a collective to have a shared intention. Um, so uh, my understanding is that you would probably consider those models in your sense. And I sort of wonder, um, you know, whether that applies to all analyses or whether that's right. Um, and, and the other is that I, I kind of wonder about kind of broader theories, um, like theories of social kinds, like the one we just heard from Catherine, like, is that something that you would kind of put into uh, understand in, in these terms as well? Yeah, um, well, to start with the first question, I, I think uh, Bratman's uh, work certainly fits well with the, with the way in which I think of uh, social ontology. And uh, Bratman himself, of course, he uses the word model uh, to describe his view, but he never says, uh, what he means by a model anywhere. And my impression is that he doesn't sort of uh, 
have any sort of very explicit idea of what is the modeling in mind when he uses that term. So uh, in that sense, uh, that sense, uh, what I presented can be, um, you know, understood as a sort of methodological articulation of, of what goes on, even 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 in in, in Michael Bradman's work. Although I did not discuss his his work here, and uh, sort of the connection to philosophy of science, uh, I think that makes much much more uh, clear um, in some ways. Uh, the types of continuities that that they are in this branch of philosophical investigation and and uh, and science. Uh, with respect to uh, to uh, to the previous talk and and uh, your own work, uh, that's something I've really been struggling with because I'm not not too certain about how to fit the sort of grounding anchoring type of type of uh, analysis of social kinds in into the into the um, you know, type of methodological perspective that I defend here. So I'm confident that out of accounts of uh, shared intentionality, for example, with the possible exception of of uh, Margaret Gilbert's work, can be accommodated under this type of perspective. And with respect to theories of social kinds and uh, crowding and anchoring and so forth, um, they are sort of uh, much more uncertain about about how to proceed, and it would be really interesting to to, to hear your perspective or or Catherine's perspective or other people's perspectives about uh, how and whether that could succeed. Yeah, no, I, I don't have a, a reaction, but I was just yeah, I I I'm, I I think it's a very interesting question. Uh, maybe Catherine has I can find it. <laughs> Uh, I need to think about it more, but I, I'm certainly sympathetic to, to the idea and uh, yeah, your description of modeling and my sense of what I felt like I was up to align a lot. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's very interesting. I think I need to think more. Um, yes, yeah, so thank you for the great talk. And uh, I had a question about the way um, your talk could be related to Assa's talk, because I had the impression that in a way, um, you try to defend uh, you, you, your talk could be used as a defense of Searle and Gilbert um, by saying that there are two kinds of ideal theories. There are th ideal theories that are just um, idealistic theories that don't relate to the world, and ideal theories that are actually are idealization and, and modelization, and then they could be used to uncover the causes in the real world and then to uh, try to change the reality that we don't like. So I have the impression that uh, there could be a kind of discussion, or it, it could be interpreted as a response, or a kind of response to other talk. So this was my my question, and um, I had a second question, uh, um, a more comprehension question, because I so I'm very sympathetic to your naturalistic approach. But then there is the question of what is the difference between philosophy and science. Uh, so I, I think that's. Uh, in a way, we could say that uh, your approach makes turns uh, philosophy into science. For instance, we could interpret in in your fashion uh, Amit Thomason's objections against Searle as a refutation. So it, the good news is that we could the philosophers could be wrong, and Amit Thomason has shown that uh, Searle is wrong with his uh, that he should rework on his model at least. So this this was my second question: the difference between philosophy and, and science. Yeah. So my. Uh... I mean, I think this, from my best perspective, it tries to try to strike a certain type of balance between um, what I think of as uh, the relative independence or autonomy, although that may be too strong a word of philosophical investigation, and and uh, and uh, it, its relevance, which is a central concern of methodological naturalists, and the appealing feature of this view, I think, is that the Allows for a certain type of type of philosophical work um, to be uh, carried out from the armchair, um, in a certain sense of speaking, while also recognizing quite important types of parallels and continuities between that type of work and the type of work that uh, that theoretical scientists engage in. And in this respect, the approaches in some sense both revisionary and sort of moderately conservative, because uh, the type of work that uh, 
has gone on, for example, in experimental philosophy, is much more um, provisionary with respect to the methods of philosophy in a sense, because uh, there the idea is that in order to be scientifically respectable, philosophical investigation has to, or at least it is recommendable to uh, sort of go into the lab, do experiments, um, collect data, and so forth. And my point is that uh, that, that it's all well to do that, but there's also a way to do philosophy in a scientifically respectable and methodologically factual matter, which does not um, sort of uh, require making those concessions. And theoretical modeling is my sort of uh, answer to that um, dilemma: how to both be a naturalist and sort of to do do work that is way theoretical and abstract as most of philosophy is. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Um, so I have one last question. Um, so yes, I, I was wondering whether uh, your um, view of um, of, for instance, Lewis, or the, we could also think uh, of uh, Guala, uh, corresponds to how they view themselves. Because I think there is another interpretation of what they are trying to do is um, in a kind of Pythagorean way of Galilean way that uh, the modeling is not just something that is in the mind of the theoretician that takes up details of reality and tries to build up something in his mind, but it's, it's the um, uncovering of underlying structures of reality that are not visible for for ordinary people, but for the uh, for people who make experiments and, and try to build models. Then um, uh, these models are represent things that are not visible for a, a ordinary people. For instance, uh, Guala and Hendrik's paper. It's it in, uncovers um, the. Um, Game structure, game structure of uh, reality. It's not just. Um, I, I think it would be an ad, another interpretation. So I'm wondering whether um, you have an idea about that, and, or, and whether you talked with them about this and how how they reacted to your, your interpretation of their own um, work. Well, I can say that I uh, interacted with them because I. Uh defended my dissertation on this topic last year, and Francisco Guala was my opponent. Um, he was a gentleman, and he did not uh, not uh, strongly oppose anything I said, so I think he would um, he would be sympathetic to this view. Um, that's my impression. And in fact, uh, Francisco himself, of course, has discussed uh, Lucian Lucia coordinated games at, uh, at uh, some length. So uh, I think that would, their work would certainly be I uh, actually I uh, realized that uh, that just before this question you asked also another question which had to do with uh, idealization and and uh, referred to uh, Arthur Burman's book and her that talk yesterday. So I just uh, thought that I could the end I could sort of flag this issue um, which is uh, quite common in the literature in philosophy of science where lots of people associate abstractions and idealization with uh, with uh, theoretical modeling and uh, of course sort of the two stretch structure of, of theoretical models makes it possible for them to accommodate a lot of unrealistic features but uh, then there's the counter argument that uh, all scientific theories and all scientific explanations um, they um, all of them involve some degree of abstraction because uh, Otherwise, one would just have to have to sort of account and include everything in one explanation. So uh, the idealization and abstraction point is important, but it sort of uh, falls out of the uh, direct indirect contrast as a method of investigating the world. And in terms of that distinction, the work by Michael Weisberg and Peter Gottfried Smith are uh, the go to sources which really identify modeling with indirect um, study and investigation of the world and sort of the feature of idealization is a secondary feature that falls out of 
that the distinctive strategy is not a defining feature of models. 